good. Michelle, I think you your I volume. Hear yeah, we can. Hi, guys. <laughs> That's funny. I think the audio went out. There we go. <laughs> it like it's all was fine right at the beginning and then it cut out. I know we're live. So hi everyone. I think we have 17 attendees. Hi, you guys. It's Miss Lonnie here from Passing to Humane, and I'm here with the amazing Miss Michelle. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> hey Lauren, how are you? Good, good. Awesome. So this is the last watercolor um, in wildlife. I'm really excited and thank you guys so much for continuously coming and supporting our programming. Um, unfortunately, we do have some technical difficulties with Michelle. I'm sure that she'll get back online. So we'll do our webinar reminders at the end of the program. But I think we're going to um, just get started. So today, and I guess I'll just show you since I'm already on video right now. Today, we're going to be doing um, raccoons and bats. So um, your supply list, I'll just show you since you guys can see me, you should have your templates ready like so. And your watercolor and your cool watercolor pens. Remember I said you guys can grab these on Amazon. It's really important that you get watercolor pens if you're gonna be doing a lot of these with me. This is our last one for the year. So if anything, we will have them again in January and February. We would love to have you guys actually let us know when we put our, um, our polls up what you guys are actually interested in because we Lauren and I are always looking for really amazing animal content information to help answer questions for you guys about our community or just about our animals in general the next part is you're going to have your scissors ready pencil and then of course like I said your awesome watercolors and your watercolor paper you don't need watercolor paper but you definitely need paper that can soak it up so cardstock anything strong is really important so that's what I recommend for sure so let me go ahead and change my camera angle. And then Lauren, we can start talking about raccoons. Um, okay. but before, awesome, but before we get started on that, um, <clears throat> I've always said to you guys, I'm sure that all of you guys know what's kind of going on already. You've been here a few times. We need to cut out our templates. And so the first one we're gonna cut out is our raccoon. And I always say, if you guys want to cut these in advance, it probably makes it a lot easier for you guys to do so. Um, but I always like cutting it for you guys so that the younger friends that are actually doing it with me can follow along and can see that sometimes it can be a little tricky. But what I like to do is cut as close to the actual template as possible. So that's really easy <clears throat> um, to get to the pieces and you're not wasting all of your cutting on a bunch of paper that's blank. So that's kind of important, the key to do that. And so um, the reason that um, Lauren and I picked raccoons and bats, I'm sure you guys have guessed, is because we're really close to Halloween. And it seems like that would be a really, really fitting animals for this time of season. Um, Lauren, are these both of these animals out around this time of year? Oh yeah, absolutely. Raccoons are pretty much out all times of year. And I mean, bats can be too. But <clears throat> raccoons, I mean, both animals are mostly nocturnal, so you usually will only see them at night, but um, they really come out whenever there's food and resources available. So if that's during the daytime, sometimes you might see them during the daytime. That's, that's so cool. I know that people have said that if you see a raccoon out during the day, that that's actually maybe a bad sign. Is that, is that really true or what's the deal with that? Not necessarily. Really, the only time you should worry if you see a raccoon out during the day is if it's um, like circling or has a head tilt or something else is wrong with it. Like maybe it's walking and it falls over. Um, but if it just looks like a normal raccoon and it's acting normally and it's out during the daytime, it, um, it could just be that there's some really yummy food nearby that they can get during the daytime and they don't feel scared so yeah got it and um in terms of raccoons in general are they since we're just going to get started and right into it are they really known to be very aggressive animals um you know that's that's an interesting question <laughs> <laughs> raccoons they're opportunistic 
omnivores, which I've talked about that before, but I'll um, explain again. Omnivore means that they eat both meat and and uh, and fruits and veggies and um, non-meat things. Um, but opportunistic means that they pretty much just get whatever they can get, whatever they'll take, whatever they can get easily. Um, so usually that includes things like grasshoppers and nuts and berries and sometimes mice. Um, and you know, they'll get food out of the garbage cans, um, and you know, nuts and fruits, um, and things like that. So if you are, you know, trying to take that food away from them or seem threatening to them, they might defend themselves and they make lots of kind of interesting noises that can maybe be scary to someone who's not used to it. I wouldn't yeah. mess with the raccoon personally, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but if there is a raccoon around that you don't want it to be around, the best thing to do is, you know, try and get a broom or use a hose or something that you could be at a safe distance while also trying to scare it or shoo it away. Um, but usually it's because there's some delicious resources there that they want to get. So, um, to prevent a raccoon from even coming around and being there in the first place, um, it's always a good idea to check and make sure you don't have any of those things readily available for them in your yard. And what things would those be exactly, Lauren? Oh, wait, you know what, Lauren? Hold on. Give me one second. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so you guys, so the next step to this is we basically outlined the raccoon silhouette, as you can see. And I did these extra pieces for you guys so you guys could see how to kind of align his head and kind of where the inside of his head goes. So just kind of fit his ear to the corner here and you'll kind of see it kind of fits together pretty well. And then go ahead and outline his little face. <clears throat> and this is where his muzzle, or what was the other word we said? Uh mm -hmm. You could say snout? nose or muzzle or snout. Yeah, any of those. Yeah. Are fine. Nose is good too. And then uh, the next part is we have this little piece. And you can, if you want to freehand it, you can also freehand it. I just made it so you could kind of see where his little muzzle line goes, like so. And then <clears throat> what you're going to do, this is kind of a little trickier part, and I'm going to just show you because um, I actually redrew it here because I actually wanted you guys to see the whole thing because it's a little bit more complex. So let me move it up closer. You guys can take a look. So what I did was I created a line that went all the way across his half face. So that you kind of split his half face like so. And I did it really lightly, but I can do it darker for you guys. And then that is gonna tell you where the eyes go. <clears throat> so when you do his little midline here, just kind of halfway through his, he his head, you're gonna draw two large eyes like so and then two small eyes. So I'm gonna do it in dark so you guys can see it darker. I think that helps. Lauren, do you see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. I just wanna make sure it's dark enough, just like that. <clears throat> and then since you already drew his little snout area, you're just gonna draw two lines up his forehead that kind of meet in the middle like this, like a triangle. And then you're gonna do the same thing on the bottom and that kind of links down to his little snout you're gonna draw. So, like so. And then that other secondary snout line was actually the pattern line that you actually drew here, just FYI. And that's pretty much it. And then you're gonna add the little ears, however you want, the little inside of the ears. And I'll pull it up closer, you guys can see it. And then finally, we added his little stripes here because they're really famous for their stripes on their tail and their cute little bandit face like that. So if you guys can see, that's kind of how it looks. Just wanna hold it up for a minute so you guys can check it out. And then, because we always pre-draw everything, let's work on our bat for a second. This one's pretty easy. Um, the raccoon's a little more detailed, but the bat is kind of a fun one. It's not a real looking bat. It's a very cartoon Halloween bat. And I wanted to do that for my friends that are celebrating um, Halloween. And we're actually making this a vampire bat. But Lauren, we don't have vampire bats around here, do we? No, that's right, we don't. Um, the main bats that we have, in the LA County area are the Mexican free-tailed bat, which is a medium-sized little brown bat um, with a tail that, that kind of goes down past beyond that tail membrane that you, the little bottom part that you drew. Um, so that's why yeah. it's called a Mexican 
can free tail back because the, the tail is hanging free. Um, and then we also have canyon bats, which is the smallest bat in the a LA area. Um, it's kind of more blonde, um, but it has black ears and wings. Um, and then we have Western Mastiff bats, which are the biggest bats. Um, they're the biggest bats found in the United States and they have wingspans up to two feet wide. Um, they're really, really cool. Yeah, That's and really then we also, cool. yeah, we also have hoary bats, um, which I really like. Uh, they have dark brown or black fur, but they have like frosted white tips on the end. It looks like, you know, your favorite boy band from the nineties have having frosted tips. Um, <laughs> they're pretty, they're pretty cool too. So thanks Lauren. So if you guys can see, I just really simple, happy bat. So you just put two little simple eyes in this cute little triangle nose and I'm making his little mouth. I'm actually making it really dramatically large. You and we all know this is like not really what they really really look like, but this is sort of a cartoon version. And then I'm gonna do the feet at the end, and I'm just gonna freestyle those those that part just because it's fun. So I'm gonna set this one aside, and then I'm gonna get started on our awesome raccoon. So um, Lauren, I know you said you've had a lot of experiences with raccoons, right? That's right, lots. <laughs> and before we get started with the raccoon, you guys, I just wanted to remind you, normally I say in watercolor that you start with, you put black laughs in all of your artwork. This one, because it's the main focus is our raccoon, he's very colorful, colorful. and I'll show you an example. So as you can see, he's all black and gray. So we're really going to focus on him first, and then we can work on the, the background later. But this is an example of kind of what it could look like if you wanted it to. And don't worry if his face isn't perfect. Raccoons' faces aren't perfect. So you got to kind of practice for this one because they look very specific, raccoons. Like they don't, you can't kind of, with the bats, I feel like you can kind of draw them and you can't really tell sometimes. Or you can, it's easy to draw a bat versus the, the detail work of a raccoon. So, so I'm going to get started on his little face part. And we're focusing, we're using a let me look, medium, a medium, if you have it, a medium tip brush, like so. And we're just going to work on his body first. And I'm going to do it really light, and then I'm going to go into dark. So, yeah. So, sorry, Lauren. So, did you say that you do work with a lot of raccoons at the shelter? Yeah, we got, we got plenty of raccoons in, because, um, you know, they're, they're, usually in the streets or in urban areas where there's lots of cars so we get a lot that get hit by cars um we get some that are orphaned babies um and we get some that have just you know gotten sick from different eating different kinds of things um so so we see them fairly often um, when you do see them, I guess you've, have you had a lot of, um, sort of aggressive situations with them in general? I'm always curious to see, cause I think a lot of people, like, I think rac raccoons are really cute, but I right. also know that you be really careful cause they're wildlife. Exactly. Like all wildlife, anything with a mouth can bite. So, um, <laughs> we always tell people to make sure that they don't go up and try to hold them or handle them or pet them or offer them food or anything like that. Um, cause raccoons are very smart and, um, and they, they are not as fearful of people as maybe they should be. Um, so it can get them into trouble sometimes since they live in our urban areas. Um, they do live throughout the United States and like wooded areas and wetlands and parks, but, um, a lot of times we find them in the suburbs and the cities, um, but pretty much anywhere that there is shelter, food, and water. Um, and and like I said, they they eat they eat pretty much anything that they can find. Um, they have you know those those cute little hands that they use to grab things. Yes. But they they don't have opposable thumbs though, um, so they you still don't. need both hands to hold on to things. And um, and their hands actually have 10 times the sensors that human hands do. So that's why you always see them holding and manipulating things with their hands. Um, and when they put things in water, it increases that sensation even more. So that's why a lot of times you'll see videos and pictures of raccoons washing their food. 
um, when really they're just kind of trying to touch it and get a feel for what they're holding on to. Interesting. And in terms of communication, do they communicate with, how do they communicate actually? They have a lot of different um, noises that they make. So they vocalize uh, in a lot of different ways. You might recognize the little chittering, chirping sounds they, they make. Um, also body language is a big one. Um, so they'll, they'll communicate with one another both of those ways. Um, and they're generally pretty solitary though. Um, the only times you really will see them together is if it's a family group. So if it's like a mom and her babies, but the only time that she's really gonna be with other adults is when it's mating season. So how, on average, how many babies do they have? Uh, usually I only see like three or four, but they can be, I think up to seven, I think is what I read last. Um, but usually not that many. Uh, like I said, I usually only see like one, two, three, or four. But even sometimes when we get litters in, it could be partial litters. Like mom could have taken some of her babies and then um, and then somewhere maybe left over if it was like in an attic or something um, that people are trying to evict them out of. Um, but the youngs, they generally stay with their mom for their first winter through their first year, and then they'll venture off on their own in spring. Um, and they can, they can live up to 16 years in the wild, but wow. usually, usually they don't live that long. They usually are like maybe five, six, seven years, but can be up to 16 if they're really successful. Wow. That's really interesting that they, it's really hard out there too. I can imagine just oh, trying yeah. to survive around us, you know, um, yeah. really you guys, I want you to really focus on lines. Um, for this project, a lot of just like lines make fur. So if you can just try to focus on in certain areas. So his face is going to be really furry and his tail is going to be really furry. As you can see, I just kind of did a really washed out body part. So it goes really dark and then it kind of goes gray. So this is a really great project if you want to practice um, kind of going gray to dark, which is a really, really cool um, thing to learn because I actually love Lauren, when I was a kid, I used to just love drawing with black and white. I was never into color. I'm just, I'm still kind of not into color. I think I wear too much black all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. But I love for it. Halloween. Yeah, it is perfect for Halloween. This is definitely a perfect one for Halloween for sure. Yeah, because um, raccoons, they're like little, they're like, they're always dressed in their Halloween costume as a little bandit. Right? So cute little bandits. Um, what I really love too, Lauren, is that I think a lot of people don't realize how important they are to kind of our ecosystem and in our neighborhoods and how they help kind of clean up, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, they definitely help with um, population of smaller rodents um, and insects and, like I said, trash. But that could also mean like carcasses and dead things that have been found on the sides of the road and stuff. So um they'll help with that sort of cleanup too because they'll eat it but yeah, it's always it's cool. go ahead sorry i was gonna say it's always important to make sure that we keep our trash secure so that they don't start getting used to having free handouts in our around humans and get too comfortable with humans because what what would the worry be there lauren because um kind of like what you were asking before right if they're aggressive and um and they they become more aggressive if they start feeling comfortable around humans and that happens when they're being provided food and resources and relying on humans for those things and then also it means that they can't they forget how to go out and find food on their own too so it's um it's really important that we're not leaving trash out but we're also not leaving pet food out i know a lot of people like to feed their pets outside um, and so it's really important that you don't just leave it out all day or all night and that you only do it at certain times of the day so that maybe even if you have outdoor cats that you're feeding, they get used to that routine um, and, and you can just be there and watch and, and have a set time during the day for maybe like 20 or 30 minutes for them to feed and make sure that no other wildlife is um, starting to rely on that food source as well. Got it. And for people who um, maybe they're having problems and they're seeing maybe these raccoons, uh, places that they don't want them to be, what, what would they do? 
So we use this word hazing a lot. I know I've said it before, but it basically just means scaring them away and reminding them to be afraid of people. So you can do that from, you could do that just by going out and making lots of noise, spraying them with the hose, things like that. But if the resources are still gonna be available to them, they're pretty persistent. So they'll probably come back and just wait until you're not home. So it's better to like, if you have a pool to get a pool cover, or if you have a garden to make sure it's fenced in, um, you know, not leaving pet food out, like I said, and, and different, different things like that to prevent them from coming in in the first place. Got it. And then let's say we're not, this is just kind of a tricky, I know we talk about this all the time, but like, let's say they didn't leave um, cat food or pet food out. What are other things that could be in the yard that is actually encouraging these animals to be in their yard? Um, pretty much anything edible. <laughs> so that could be bugs, that could be um, different plants. Like if you have a garden, like I said, um, if you have a compost, uh, trash, barbecues so making sure your barbecues are nice and clean what about um, bird food uh, oh my gosh food. yeah bird feeders what was i of course i always talk about bird feeders i almost forgot. i know set you up girl <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, they love a bird feeder so you know that bird seed is going to attract a lot more than birds got it so as you can see you guys i'm kind of setting up a little outdoor area here for him a little, I, I don't know, I feel like it's just like a brush vibe, but he's outside. So I'm going to do just some really basic. And what's really cool about doing landscape stuff is you can kind of be really, because it's not, the photo's not really, the painting's not really about the background. It's really more about him. So I'm going to work on his eyes in a minute, but I kind of wanted to talk about different landscapes you guys can play around with and different textures and using your brush in different ways can give a different sort of look and a feel. So this is definitely, he looks like he's like afternoon raccoon, like out on the town. And this one's more like a night, a night version when you see him in the darkness by your car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, in terms of, uh, like you said, they're, they're relatively solitary, but where do they, where do they actually live, Lauren? Like they'll just pop out, like I said, in the middle of the night, where are they actually living in the day? Right. Yeah. They, um, pretty much anywhere. Uh, they, they like to, they like to be in quiet, dark spaces. That's where they like to den up, um, especially if they're going to have babies or they have had babies. So um, they really like, you know, holes in trees, under stumps, um, things like that. But then also um, if you maybe like leave your shed open or if you have a opening to a crawl space under your house or in your attic, those are all really, really um, attractive spaces for them to go as well. So you gotta be really careful and do kind of like a perimeter search of your home to make sure that there's no openings for them to get into because it's not a really good spot for them. It's much better for them to be out in the wild in trees and, and in natural spaces. Got it. And then I'm almost done with my background, but I've noticed that raccoons have really big eyes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty common for um, nocturnal animals who need to see in the dark. There's some nocturnal animals that don't need to see. They just kind of go with their other senses. But raccoons, they, they use their eyesight. And they sometimes if you see them at night and you'll see they're like reflecting over their eyes. So it looks even creepier. <laughs> but yeah, so they, um, they have pretty good eyesight. And they need to, right? Sort of because they're going to be out walking around at night and they, they need, need to be to able find to find food. Mm -hmm. Totally. So you guys, I'm thinking, themselves. yeah, right. Um, so I'm just kind of doing a nice blue that kind of matches the background um, together. So you can kind of have his eyes pop just like this. And we're going to color in his little eyeballs just like that. And then the last thing we're going to do is I'm going to take my black and I'm just going to make a C shape around, and I'll show you, kind of like a C. So you're not going to color in the whole thing. You're just going to make a C so it kind of pops, just like that. And if I can show you, you can see kind of the, the difference. The kids can use a pen too, right, for that oh part? Oh my gosh, such a good idea, Lauren. Yeah, if you guys need to look, do more fine, fine, thinner stuff and you don't have 
um, an option of a thinner pen. You can always go back and do some of even the muzzle you could do in, in a thin pen, like a Sharpie or like a regular pen too. So yeah. So I think this guy's done. I like him. I love it. So cute. Yes, I really like it too. So let's see. Now can we go, let's go into Halloween world and do yeah. something like that. Um, and I will show you guys the example of this, oops, of this guy too. So this is our little funky Halloween bat. And I I would love to see you guys send us um, your stuff. So this is the fun, the funky one I made. So feel free to do different funky colors because this is definitely not, I've never seen a yellow bat. Have you, have you seen a yellow bat, Lauren? There's some bats that have like a yellowish tint to them. Really? Yeah. Very Brownish cool. So I've, yeah, I've never seen it. <laughs> but you're right. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> there's so many different kinds of bats in the world. I'm sure there's one really? for every color. Maybe not every How color. Many, are there like maybe 20 kinds of bats, Lauren? How many kinds are there, you think? Oh my gosh. There's like hundreds of different kinds of bats. That's Can amazing. you ladies hear me? Yes. Oh. Welcome back. back, friend. Okay. Um, so speaking of number of bats, I want to throw a poll up and see yeah, if right. our friends watching know how many species of bats there are in the world. Oh, sweet. We can see it. It looks good. Hmm. What do you guys think? Lot, there are lots of different answers. And the vote is actually evenly split at 51 to 100 or more than 1,000. So I'm going to give it a couple more seconds before we close this up. So, yeah, it was, it was evenly split before fit between 51 to 100 or more than 1,000. Hmm. So, there are more than a thousand species of bats in the entire world. Wow, that's oh, yeah. so cool. So many. So I'm sure one of those is yellow. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> then I'm okay. Then I'm all good, you guys. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a kind of a natural color. I mean, yellow is a natural color in nature, so it totally makes sense. But now I want to look up the bats and see, um, ladies, this a yellow, a yellowish bat would be really cool. So, um, Lauren. I mean, bats are kind of perceived as really scary and, you know, especially the vampire bat, but can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, they're actually super, super important for our ecosystem. They disperse seeds. So like they, they will sometimes, the ones that eat, um, the ones that eat fruits will disperse seeds through their poop all over, which is That's really cool. good for trees and different plants. Um, they pollinate things so that helps fruits and vegetables grow. Um, and they're the ones around here are all insectivores, which means they eat lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of bugs, um, which I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a big fan of bugs, especially mosquitoes, especially oh, moths. Moths yeah. scare me. And so I like bats for that reason. Um, and uh, and so they're really good pest control. And, you know, a colony of bats could eat millions of insects in a single night. So um, especially insects that carry diseases and stuff like mosquitoes, they help keep those under control um, and, and help with, you know, farmers who, you know, are worried about their crops getting eaten by bugs. They, bats will help with that. Um, and they're a good indication of, of just the general health of the environment. So if there's lots of bats, it usually is, means there's that it's a pretty healthy environment. So um, thing, species like the hoary bat, that last one that I was telling you about that has the frosted tips, um, they only roost in, in foliage. So like trees and thing and, and plants and stuff. So um, if their, their presence or absence in an area will be a good indication of, of the quality of that habitat, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, there's, I think, about 16 different kinds of species of bats in our area. Um, but the ones I mentioned earlier are the ones that we definitely see the most. Um, and yeah. 
what other questions do you have about that? Well, I think, I mean, I think I said this to you is I used to go play tennis by the Greek theater in Griffith Park. And I, I'm sure some of my friends have been at Griffith Park. And at night, like in the summers, you could totally hear them and you could totally see them coming out of the canyon, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. So what did you hear when you heard them? What did it well, sound like? I hear like? the flapping. I mean, mm -hmm. their, their wings are amazing. And mm -hmm. I would actually, I feel like I did hear them. I mean, what kind of sounds do they make, Lauren? Because I did think I heard them. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of bats kind of make a chirping sound too. Um, but they all have different kinds of vocalizations. These species sound a little bit different. Um, so they um, they do that because it's called, because of what's called echolocation, which I think some of my friends maybe have heard of and maybe some of the, the friends watching haven't heard of that, but they will make noises and it they'll send them out kind of like they're throwing a baseball, um, but they're using their voice and that will hit something and it'll bounce back and it'll go into their ear holes like those big ears that you're drawing mm -hmm. um and it helps them figure out where things are because their eyes aren't very good um they're not blind that's a misconception but they do rely more on this echolocation thing to help them figure out you know where a building is so they don't hit into it or where the bugs are so that they can go and scoop them up so that's the main way that they communicate. Got it. And then how many babies do they have at a time? Oh my gosh, so many babies. There's so many um, babies. Yeah, I I couldn't tell you specifically, but I can tell you that a lot of bats um will have uh, they have live babies, so they're actually mammals. They're not um, reptiles or birds or anything like that. Um, they're warm-blooded, um, just like us. And so they have live babies too, which is another indication of mammal. Um, and they, a lot of bats will have uh, like a nursery of babies. So they all, all the bats will have their babies and then they'll all put them all in one little area. And so they, everybody helps out taking care of the babies, which I think is pretty cool. That is really cool. So are they very social then? Cause they have to be around each other. Is that, is that a form of protection? A lot of bats are, yeah. Um, there are still some like those hoary bats that I was talking about earlier that are mostly solitary. Um, those are the ones that prefer to roost alone in the trees. Um, but the other ones that live in caves and in, you know, sometimes you hear about bats being in people's attic or in chimneys, those are the more communal kinds of bats. Got it. And do we encourage bat bats to kind of live near us and around us since you brought that up? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. So if you want to have bats around, obviously you don't want them living in your attic or inside your house. Right. But, um, it is good to, to have, to encourage bats to come be in our areas. Cause it is kind of hard for them in the urban areas. Um, they're not super, super well adapted, but they are, there are some that are, are slightly more adapted than others, but, um, you can look online and there's lots of cool plans for how to build bat boxes and they're kind of like bird houses um, and they encourage bats to come and live in uh, their more urban areas. It gives them a little bit of a hiding spot. Um, and so, so I think that that can be a really good fun project for people to do as well. That's so cool. Um, Lauren, do we get a lot of bats actually at the shelter like for any reasons? Um, usually the only bats we get at the shelter are ones that are unfortunately really sick. Um, mm -hmm. So we usually get them and then um, and they usually end up passing away when we have them because um, bats don't really do very well in captivity at all. Um, they're they're very wild creatures, right? So um, so we always send them in just to make sure that they don't have rabies or anything and most of the time they don't. Um, and so that's a good thing. Every once in a while we will get a positive, but um, definitely more negative results than positive results. And especially healthy bats, we're, we're not going to see too much rabies in that. Um, but, but definitely if you ever see a bat on the ground, you want to make sure you don't touch it. You need to talk to an adult 
and um, and they should call us and um, make sure that they are taking care of that safely and so that no one um, no one accidentally gets bit because sometimes bats can accidentally bite people when they're scared and yeah. they're so small that sometimes if you're asleep or if you're you know just a little kid and and you don't even realize it um, you might not even notice that you've been bitten because they're so small. And Lauren, that like rarely happens, right? I mean, I feel like they talk about that oh, yeah. a lot. That doesn't happen a lot. No, hardly ever. Yeah. Bats so, really don't want anything to do with people for the most part. They really yeah, want you to can stay away from them. us. <laughs> like most of them don't. They're just, yeah. we just all kind of have to live together, right? Yeah. Yeah, very true. So um, friends, so I'm kind of almost done. I'm just outlining the inside of his mouth, as you can see. And I'm going to just do a little line. And like uh, Lauren said earlier, which is a really great suggestion, you can always go back with a Sharpie if you feel like you can't do the fine line work. So I went ahead and did that. And then my favorite part is just doing the funky, the funky little feet. I'm going to make them extra thick. Like mm -hmm. a lot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like my favorite part of this yeah. random thing. And that's very Halloween vibe, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how do you like it, Lauren? I like this I one. I love it. Thanks. So funny. So cute. We really want to see your work, you guys. I mean, it, it fills our hearts with joy when we see you guys send us um, all the cool work that you did after watching our watercolor series. Lauren, I mean, uh, Michelle, are you there? I am here. I have a question. Do Does anybody have questions about the cool funky bats or raccoons? Um, so I do actually have one question for you, Lonnie. Um, oh. what, what's the most effective way to cut out the templates? Oh, well, what I would say is, um, I have an example of a template here. So this is kind of, it got water on it, but what I would say is if we pretended this was a pair of scissors, let's just say this is a pair of scissors, right? I would cut as close as I could to the piece. So that you're not cutting all this because sometimes i have friends that maybe they don't know how to cut and they start doing this and it takes forever so what you want to do is cut it as close to whatever you're cutting out as possible and that'll limit the amount of energy that it takes to cut the piece out so there you go yeah okay. all right so lauren how long do bats live uh well it's different for each species so i definitely encourage you guys to go and research what the most common species around you are and see maybe what the lifespan is for those but because they're mammals they can live they can live multiple years but like i said it's going to be different for each kind of bat and usually the bigger bats last a little longer Oh, speaking of big bats, I've got a poll question to put up for cool. our friends. Um, so there's over a thousand species of bats in the world. What is the largest wingspan of a bat that's been recorded? I love this one. Oh, wow. All right. The answers are all over the board. I really do think the answer is going to surprise everyone. Ooh. All right. And the poll is closing in three, two, and one. So the most popular answer was 18 inches. However, the largest wingspan of a bat recorded in the world is six feet. Oh, that's amazing. Six feet. Yes. Totally those, those are the the flying fox bats yeah i think six feet is taller than all three of us yeah they're real they're fruit, they're fruit eaters so and then oh let's see um where do giant flying fox bats live <laughs> um uh they live actually there's a rescue in texas where they <laughs> live <laughs> <laughs> um, um I don't live one here. <laughs> but yeah, they they don't naturally live here, but they um 
they naturally are found in Australia, Madagascar, Asia, um, some of the more like tropical islands. Okay. Cool. And then if we can switch gears back to raccoons, what kind of insects do raccoons eat? Oh, all kinds. They like, I mean, they like the bigger ones that they can really get their hands on. So like grubs and um, crickets and grasshoppers and, uh, you know, beetles. Um, so the bigger ones, the scarier ones, in my um, opinion. I, I actually have a question. Do they actually eat like rats and stuff like that too? Or is it just, they do too, huh? Mm-hmm. They do. That's great. They clean everything up for us. I love that. Mm-hmm. And eggs. Sometimes they steal eggs. Oh my goodness. That Anybody with a chicken coop knows that raccoons are public enemy number one. Wow. Uh, and I know that earlier you were talking about how raccoons can sometimes be vicious. Um, but I'm wondering if our friends know what the average size of a, an adult raccoon is. So I'm going to launch that poll. Ooh. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're, they're necessarily vicious. Maybe I give them a little bit of a bad rap, but they're <laughs> definitely not as docile as say opossums or skunks or the other mesocarnivores. But that's good to know, Lauren. That's really good to know because I didn't know that, you know, and I see I have opossums everywhere here. So, yeah. All right. And the poll is closing. Um, this one is very interesting. So we've got um, about a 27% uh, say 10 to 20 pounds. And then there's a mixed bag between th uh, at 33% of 20 to 45 pounds or more than 50 pounds. So, um, but the average raccoon is uh, 20 to four, adult raccoon is 20 to 45 pounds. That's about the size of a small dog. Cause I know my dog only weighs about 12 pounds. And you know, our, our coyotes around here don't hardly get over 35 pounds either. Yeah. So raccoons are, they can just be pretty hefty. And the ones around here don't usually get that big. I've never seen one that big. The biggest I've probably seen is like 25 pounds. Wow. Um, Michelle, I know we missed the intro to um, sort of the webinar reminders. Was there anything that we needed to remind them anyways? Um, actually, yes. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody. And I just wanted to remind you guys that next week, we will have um, our story time we, and we'll be reading Sticky the Kitty, A Sticky Situation written by Chuck Hawley. And we will also have a special guest joining us that day. So I can't tell you who it is. If you wanna find out, you gotta come join us. Um, and then later on in the month, we'll also be reading the second book in the Sticky series, Sadie Comes to Town. So we'll find out who exactly Sadie is as well. Um, we also have these amazing activities for you guys to join us with, lots of um, online things coming up. Um, but we also have this careers in animal welfare. We've already gotten through, talked to Sarah Dubochet and Jackson Galaxy. But our next presenter is Dr. Curtis Ng, and he's a wildlife and exotic veterinarian. So he may be able to talk about more in depth some of those animals that uh, Bonnie has been painting. Um, I've put the link to submit your artwork in the chat box, but it's also right here. Okay, and if at any time you missed any part of this recording, had to get up and get your supplies or what have you, it was recorded and it'll be sent to you guys tomorrow. So, and that's all I got. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you to Lauren and Michelle. Thank you guys so much for our watercolors. This is the end for this year, friends. So we will start again in 2021. So Woo. please sign up. I'm excited. Um, and then please feel free to email us any suggestions of things you'd like us to do with watercolor and wildlife. 
And I think that's it for me, right? Uh, How are you guys? Well, hey, Lonnie, so they need to know where to email us at. So that that's can be true. at kids at PasadenaHumane.org. And usually I respond to that. Sometimes Miss Lonnie does. Um, but we can't wait to join you guys in the new year when we will have a whole slew of new animals coming to, to you. Awesome. All right, Send guys. Send us your pictures. Can't wait yes, to see pictures. And thanks again, you guys. We'll see you next year. See you next right. year. Bye, ladies. Bye. Bye. Thank you.